As one of the oldest cities in the country, the history of New York is also the history of America. Plymouth Church in downtown Brooklyn, for example, has been around for 172 years, standing as a testament to the true pursuit of liberty. Underneath this church is a secret so important in its time that keeping it meant the difference between life and death, between freedom and slavery. So, what's in the basement? This is the Undercroft at Plymouth Church, which was a stop on the Underground Railroad. I'm here with Senior Minister Brett Younger, who knows all about this church's history as a stopgap on the way to freedom. How old is the area that we're in right now? This was the basement of First Presbyterian Church before it moved, so this building was built in 1823. And for the enslaved people that were coming through here, where were they coming from and where were they going? Why did they pick Brooklyn as the stop? We're not sure exactly how many freedom seekers came through here. Uh, the best guess I've seen was about three dozen. They were coming from different places in the Deep South. They were trying to get to the East River, to the Hudson River, and then on their way to Canada because there wasn't any place in the United States that was safe for them at that point. Do you know how long they were expected to stay down here? Was it an overnight thing or were they underneath here where there were church services going on upstairs? The laws were such that you could come into a church without a warrant, but you couldn't go into a private home. And so they did not stay here a long time. Usually they would immediately go to the minister's house or to another church member's house so that they wouldn't be as easily uh, caught. Do you know for how long this process went on? Did it go all the way up to emancipation or was it like a period of a couple of years? It went all the way up to emancipation. The dates are 1827, uh, New York uh, outlaws slavery, but then in 1850, the Fugitive Slave Act makes it uh, illegal not to turn in a runaway, and so that's when the Underground Railroad kicks in. Church members made a decision to break the law. They could have gone to jail, they could have been fined, they could have faced boycotts of their businesses, but they chose to do what was right uh, in the face of some real risks. Which member of the church was responsible for starting this whole process and making this a place where freedom seekers could come? Henry Ward Beecher was the first minister here and a strong abolitionist and was brought here to be an abolitionist. And so he was the most important figure in terms of our role in the abolitionist movement. So who's this handsome gentleman we're looking at here? Uh, maybe handsome, maybe not. Uh, Mark Twain came here several times and said that when he preached, he was the handsomest man in the world, but when he walked out of the pulpit, he looked like a singed cat. Uh, you, you can decide for yourself. Uh, Twain described his preaching as howling sarcasms into the wind, sawing the air with his arms, exploding minds of eloquent, discharging rockets of poetry. So he was quite the drama dramatist in terms of his preaching. Sounds like he was very charismatic. Yes, he, he was kind of the first mega church minister in that he drew crowds. Uh, the sanctuary uh, sat 2000 and he filled it twice every Sunday for about 40 years. They, the ferries started running, there was no Brooklyn Bridge at that point, from Manhattan on Sundays to help the tourists get to hear Beecher preach. They were called Beecher boats at the time because his popularity was just hard to imagine at this point in our history. And I understand he has a couple of uh, famous relatives. Harry Beecher Stowe is his sister, and she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. When Lincoln met her during the Civil War, he shook her hand and said, so I hear you're the little lady who started this great war. It was the best-selling novel of the 1800s, so his sister, in some ways, is much more famous than Henry uh, at this point. His father was Lyman Beecher, who was one of the leading Calvinist preachers of the day. And so Henry made this interesting progression from growing up on the far right of the religious spectrum, Calvinism, very conservative approach to faith. Henry moves to Brooklyn and it continues moving him to the left. He becomes much more inclusive, much more gospel of love rather than gospel of judgment. I'm sure he's not the first person that moved to Brooklyn and got a little bit more liberal. Brooklyn does that for all of us, yes. 
So in addition to Beecher, there are other people involved in abolition and emancipation that have a strong history in this church, including Abraham Lincoln. 1859, Lincoln starts talking about running for president, so Plymouth invites him to come and be part of their lecture series. Now, he doesn't make it here until February of 1860, and, um, but he gives the Cooper Union speech the day after attending uh, worship here. We have a Lincoln pew where Lincoln sat. Interestingly, he was still in town a couple of weeks later, and so he, the first time he came for political reasons. The second time he came because he just wanted to hear Beecher preach. The piece right here, it's a piece of the coat that Lincoln was wearing when he was assassinated which is an odd relic to have, but someone gave it to us. Do we know how this got here specifically? They or? cut little pieces of the coat and sold it to different people. And one of our, either one of our church members or someone uh, related to the church donated to the church at some point. In addition to hiding people in the undercroft of the church, Beecher also included mock slave auctions as a part of his effort towards ending slavery. So. Who is this a portrait of? Well, we know Beecher, but what is this portrait commemorating? This is uh, Sally Maria Diggs. She was nine years old, and her owner was about to sell her uh, for $900. Her grandmother became very concerned about it and asked Beecher for help. This was the first mock slave act auction that actually happened in worship on Sunday mornings at Plymouth. The, they would take up an offering and try to buy the freedom of the person who was in slavery. The cost for her was $900. They took up an offering. It was $1,200. Uh, included a, a ring uh, that a woman named uh, Rose Terry threw into the offering plate. Beecher, dramatist that he was, pulls the ring out of the plate, puts it on um, Sally and says, with this ring, I wed thee to freedom. They changed her name at that point uh, to Rose after the woman who gave the, the ring and Ward after Henry Ward Beecher. So he's very humbling. Do we know what happened to Rose Ward? Yes, she had this wonderful life. She took the extra money and became a, a teacher in Washington, D.C. A sad part of her life. Seventy years later, she was invited back for a church anniversary, and she brought the ring with her. Her own daughter had died, and so she had no one to pass it down to, and she gave it back to the church and thanked them for helping her have this uh, great life as an educator. Plymouth Church's abolitionist ideals remain in practice to this day, with the current church participating in modern efforts to end human trafficking. There may not be a physically underground railroad anymore, but landmarks like the Plymouth Basement remind us that no matter what time period you're in, there will always be good people fighting for freedom. <laughs>